Bobby. Uh, it's good to see uh, you House members. Uh, never get to have lunch with any of you or see you too often except for on Zoom. And uh, But uh, we're all in, I guess, the same shape. Um, but it's good to see you and, and start working together toward the tail end, I hope, of our session. Um, we've got your, um, I want, well, I guess before I go too far, I want to welcome Anson and, and Steve and Allison uh, to our joint meeting. Um, and we've started working on your miscellaneous ag bill. So um, I expect that to move forward in, uh, you know, in the near future. Um, but anyhow, uh, getting back to the orders of today, um, we'd like to uh, invite Anson uh, and, and his crew to fill us in on the economic uh, development plan that the administration has put forward and, and uh, to see how you know, that may fit into to everything. It's going to be in a separate bill. Um, and I know, uh, but I don't know, I haven't seen a copy of the bill yet. And uh, so Anson, uh, if you want to take it away, sure. uh, we'll uh, get started. Thank you, uh, senators, and thank you, representatives, uh, for the opportunity to uh, testify today. Uh, with me, as you mentioned, uh, your voice isn't coming through very well, Anson. Is, is Maybe he should uh, turn off his video. Steve Collier with the Agency of Agriculture, also Allison Eastman uh, on. Linda, would you uh, get? No, I'm going to turn off my vi uh, audio, uh, my video. Better? Is this better? Yes. Yeah. Right. Is this better? Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Anson? Don't hear you at all now, Anson. Better. <laughs> Okay, I'm just, I'm just a good go reason audio. for better okay. broadband and internet we're, in the state of Vermont. Yeah, uh, we're gonna send them out. Well, soft. thanks. The, yes, are you there? It's still not great. No, I'm gonna try. Okay. Okay. The uh, it said the host had muted me, so still not great. Let me let me see if I can move around a little bit. Okay, that's, that's good. Better. Right Here we go. All right, I'm just gonna just keep on audio. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, to uh, testify. Also on the line is uh, uh, Deputy Eastman and Steve Collier with the Agency of Ag. I just want to go over some uh, high level um, material for you. And, and Steve also has a, a copy of the proposed legislation as it relates to the uh, stimulus payments for dairy farmers and dairy processors. So he's, he's standing ready if you wanted to go through that after I finish up here. So yeah. in short, um, um, this legislation uh, is about uh, survival, um, survival for Vermont's dairy farmers and also Vermont's cheesemakers, um, those dairy farmers and those who make cheese, uh, butter, yogurt, ice cream, and milk, they're all facing uh, an uncertain future. Uh, the collapse of markets uh, overnight has dozens into profound losses. Uh, the financial impact has already hit farm families, and the forecast is dismal for next month also July into August with estimated milk prices at historic lows and it could extend into the fall. So why do we need the grants? Well, um, take a look at the cheesemakers, for example. Uh, they lost about 50 to 90% of their markets. Uh, they dried up overnight. Um, those markets being you know, primarily in some of the hot spots of New York, Boston, Washington, uh, and where Vermont cheese uh, was on the menu. So those, those went away. So they had to find uh, new ways to do business and also uh, suffered uh, tremendous losses because of that. If we take you to the farm or where the animals are, uh, it's projected that small, um, medium, large farms, all of them uh, will sustain losses. Uh, the average loss across the entire enterprise uh, could be close to uh, 
a loss of $270,000 in income uh, over the grand uh, uh, scheme of all the farmers together. Those are averages and those are projected losses. So it's substantial. Uh, it's projected. Anson, you yeah. said 270,000? 270,000 is the projected uh, loss of income over the average of all the farms. So you've got about 760 farms we're talking about. So we're saying the average losses over that entire uh, field is about two hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So it's it's uh, it's it's substantial per farm if it's the average per farm over the over the uh, over the losses for all of them. So you take your large farms, your medium farms, your small farms, your certified small farms all together. The losses could total, you know, up into two hundred seventy thousand dollars across the entire enterprise there. Um, we also have uh, five farms that closed uh, already in the month of May, uh, and many more could follow uh, if, we don't, uh, if we don't act. So as we continue to try to open up Vermont again, it's important that uh, we keep these farms in business. Uh, you take our cheesemakers. We've spent the last uh, two decades growing this cheesemaker industry, diversified our operations, um, and many of those are at risk if we do not do something uh, to help them get through the next uh, few months. Um, so it also, uh, you know, hits other people in the, uh, in the uh, equation as well. So other business that rely on dairy are at risk as well. So those who rely on dairy for a paycheck, we're talking about the feed and seed dealers the veterinarians, those who sell to and supply our farmers, uh, and all the jobs that are related to dairy. Uh, hundreds of jobs are at stake uh, uh, because of, of dairy. And if they can't get a paycheck, they can't pay their employees a paycheck, so it's a spiraling uh, effect on that. So what is our proposal? Uh, it's twofold. Uh, one is uh, a proposal to give stimulus grants to dairy farmers and the second part is to give stimulus checks to those that are processing dairy uh, into a product. The total package is uh, $50 million. Uh, 40 million would be allocated to dairy farmers. Uh, the remaining $10 million would be allocated to dairy processors, including those who make cheese, butter, yogurt, ice cream, and milk that have all sustained losses under COVID-19. It's a similar uh, situation for our friends that own restaurants, inns and hotels and small businesses. Uh, many of those are located in our small towns and villages. And these grants uh, would provide some relief and some hope uh, that pushes Vermont towards recovery. We need to push people towards recovery through this. And it's about survival uh, and setting up farmers for success uh, down the road. So, um, our proposal is a $50 million package with stimulus uh, grants to dairy farmers and dairy processors. And um, I'm happy to take some questions or if you would like, uh, Steve can run down um, sort of the nuts and bolts uh, of, the, uh, of the bill as well, uh, Senator. Yeah, <clears throat> well, thank you, Anson. <clears throat> um, on the, the five farms that have closed uh, recently, uh, do you know if they're small, medium, or large, uh, or what the production was on those five farms? I don't have that uh, right offhand. My my uh, my gut tells me they're on the small to medium size. I don't believe any of them were in the large category, uh, but it's the small to medium size farmers. Yeah, and the question I have in regards to that is. Um, what happens to their their quota system? Uh, does it does it make the other farmers instead of being at fifteen percent, fourteen percent? Y'all, because I don't. What I'm concerned about is our losing our production and having New York pick it up, uh, pick it up, and. If we're going to lose production, our farmers that are left ought to be able to uh, pick up that quota or that that gain in in the loss of milk. 
Yeah, I, I don't I don't have an a, an answer for that. We've we've based it on uh, the payment structure based on four categories, and yeah. we thought we, we thought we'd begin on March first because that's you know kind of when things started to really impact the dairy industry, and also we don't want um, we thought starting at that date we don't want people you know coming in and out of the different categories if you did it up, upon passage of the. Uh, uh, of the legislation. So it's, it sort of sets the bar on, on March 1st as a way to when the, you know, COVID really started to really start to heat up and, and impact what was happening in dairy. So that's kind of our a stake in the ground that we thought that would be a, a good date to start with, uh, uh, with, our, with our group. But um, happy to explore in more detail sort of the ones that did exit the business um, uh, since March 1st to figure out what category they are in and, and the, the size of their operation and their production for you. Yeah. Well, hey Bobby. I, I, yes. Bobby, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, do you see the blue hands that are up? Do you, are you aware of the blue hands? Rodney has his hand up and so does Terry. Um, uh, and I don't know if you were finished with your questioning, but um, they both have questions. Yeah, we don't use blue hands. We just put our finger up like that. <laughs> um, um, but uh, no, go ahead, uh, Rodney. Uh, you had a question, and then I'll get Carrie. It's not a question. It's a statement. Uh, so I know with my cows, and I'm, I know some others too, they didn't go out of production. They went to different farms. And uh, so you didn't, didn't lose... I don't believe we lost any production in the state of Vermont. They just went to different farms. And Agrimark had a short, and I don't know if it's still, still active now or not, but they had a short window where uh, the farms that went out could transfer some of their base to other farms. Not all the base, but some of it. So, um, Depending on if they were able to acquire the base, you know that might change their their uh, quota type thing. Yeah. yeah, I know main some main farms have sold their cows, and the reason they got rid of the cows is because of the base. And Agrimart was allowing the base to go with the, with the cows, so the farmer that bought the cows was paying, of course, more money, uh, but the cows went to the beef house and the quota went to the farm. And, and I think that's a pretty poor policy for the milk processors to get into. I think there should be uh, some regulation on that to, uh, because now they're putting value on the quota already and, and uh, but anyways, uh, thank you, Rodney. Uh, Terry? It's just another indication that the whole industry wants to go to large farms and not small farms. Yeah. Terry, did you yeah. have a uh, We had one, I believe you would consider him a small farm, I think under 200 cows anyway, that his cows went uh, between a week and two weeks ago. And then this morning he was advertising his Agrimark base for sale. So I'm not sure what they charge for the base, but uh, I thought that was interesting. But he would be, con I believe that cows went to another farm. I'm not sure where, but uh, so they're, they're still in production at, at some point. I believe they, I consider them an organic farm. Yeah, are there other rules? Yeah, I was just wondering if um, we could get some more details, particularly on the stimulus to processors, um, the payments to processors. I, ha I have more questions about the big pa package in general, but um, wanted to hear some details on how the money would be distributed um, before we get into broader questions, if that's okay. Yeah, Anson. Uh, sure. Can you answer sure. I don't know if it's uh, appropriate, Senator. If maybe at, at this point, Steve could maybe walk you through some of the, some of the key points of the 
of the legislation so that you can get some real uh, some real details. I think that might be helpful if you if you if you'd like that. Yeah, that'd be fine. Well, thank you, and and thank you so much to both members of the committee, both committees. We um, we know how much you all care about this issue, and it's been heartening to us as we try to develop this plan to to know that you share our goals, and so that makes this part of it. Uh, and it's such a difficult situation that makes it easier knowing that we all share the same commitment to help the dairy farmers and the dairy processors. So we've tried to construct a, a plan that fits within the federal parameters as this is part of the coronavirus relief fund money and also distributes the money as best we can to those who most need it. So essentially there are two, as the secretary said, two different programs. One is $40 million to, to dairy farmers. Another is $10 million to dairy processors. I think a key for everyone to think about as we evaluate this program is that the goal is to compensate for economic harm. So we're not just, we're not proposing that flat packages be presented. Instead, each person to qualify for the funding, and this is something that we think is required by federal law, needs to demonstrate actual losses. So what we propose is our, ma our we, what we propose are maximum amounts based on the on the economic harm that's proven by the individual applicant. So how we've defined economic harm is that it has to be expenses or lost revenue that are related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's the threshold question. If you've lost revenue or if you have additional expenses related to the pandemic, then we believe you're eligible to receive these funds. Some other pieces that we've added, those criteria for economic harm is you need to be a current producer. And this raises the question of those farms that have already gone under, whether or not that's the right policy choice is something you'll have to think of. We, um, we, the idea here was to keep farms in business. And I think the state across the package has had a similar requirement that businesses either need to be operating or if they're closed because of the pandemic, they need to have a good faith plan to reopen. So that's a policy choice that at least preliminarily was made was that we want to save those operating farms because uh, you know that is a, a huge goal that all of us share. Another, um, another piece is that they have to demonstrate that the losses are, losses are caused by the pandemic. So that's kind of hand in hand what I've already said, but it, it, it's got to be, it can't just be a loss related to something else. It has to be caused by COVID-19. And then uh, I think the secretary touched on this before, but the period, and this is prescribed by federal law, so I don't think this can change, is the period of losses has to be between March 1st of 2020 and December 30th of 2020. The, the losses have to be incurred, and that's quite clear in the federal act, during those dates. So that we propose losses for that time period because that's what federal law states. We also think it's appropriate to start there because that's when the losses really began to trigger. And as um, I think the secretary already said, we also propose freezing uh, the evaluation of the farms and the processors on March 1st so that when we're evaluating anybody now, we what we've proposed is that we'll be evaluating them as they were registered or licensed with the agency as of March 1st. And that's so that there's no attempt to shift size status um, because of the funds. And it could be, we've tried to make this as administratively as simple as possible so that we can hopefully expedite the payments uh, and not have to spend a lot of time trying to verify exactly what's happened. So that's part of the basis is to freeze the time on, as of March 1st for that reason. <laughs> So as far as the farm, the farm categories go, as mentioned, there are four. These are all based on existing statutory parameters that I believe were all developed for water quality purposes. But the four categories I'm sure you're all familiar with are small farms, certified small farms, medium farms, and large farms. So the small farms are typically under 50 cows. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, sheep and goats, dairy sheep and dairy goats are also included in the package. They will fall, I think, almost all within the small farm category, although there may be maybe one or two in the certified small farm category, but I don't believe so. I think they're all small farms. And as I understand it, there's approximately 45 of those, but our, our numbers are not 
um, completely concrete at this juncture. But the, the, so the small farms are mostly under 50 cows. There is some variance on that depending upon the potential to discharge. But for the most part, those small farms have less than 50 cows. We, we, um, the grant amount that we're proposing, and again, this is the maximum grant amount that we're proposing for small farms is $42,500. Uh, as the secretary mentioned earlier, we projected approximate losses of $270,000 per farm on average. Obviously that varies depending on your production and size, but we've proposed the minimum grant of $42,500 for small farms. That means that any farm out there who's lost $42,500 will get it. Uh, and that's, that's by design. The next category is- You said that was the minimum amount. Is there more than that for that group? No, sorry, the minimum amount for all farms, including even a large farm, but the, the maximum amount for a small farm would be $42,500. But for any farm in the state that lost at, at least $42,500, that would be covered. So every farm would get at least that amount, but that's the maximum for small farms. I didn't say that very well, sorry. Um, the, so the next, next category is certified small farms. And those are farms that are 199 cows or fewer. They have to have at least, generally they have at least 50 and they're also certified for water quality purposes. So most of those farms fall between 50 and 199 cows. And um, the, the grant, the proposed grant amount for them, bump, maximum grant amount bumps up to $60,000. So between those two categories, and again, our numbers are not precise yet, but between those two categories, we estimate that that's about 80% of all of the farms in Vermont are either small farms or certified small farms. So given the depth of this crisis and given how vulnerable many small farms are, we've really tried to prioritize and protect those small farms with covering at least that initial base of loss that they can demonstrate. So it's, um, it may or may not cover the whole loss for, during the short term, but it certainly uh, is a big help. So for the next category, it's uh, medium farms, and those range from 200 to 699 cows. And the maximum grant amount for those proposed farms is $90,000. And we we think there's roughly 105 medium farms. Yeah, that's what we have. So that's a, about 16% or so of the total. Again, these aren't precise, but close. And then the final category of farms is large farm operations. And those are operations that have more than 700 cows or 700 or more. And the proposed maximum <laughs> grant for that, level, for that tier of farm is $110,000. So for the four tiers, it ranges from 42.5 at the low end for the small farms up to $110,000 for the largest farms. Yeah, how, how did you reach those numbers? Uh, because, uh, you know, if you've got 49 cows, um, you know, probably a third of them are dry, dry cows. Uh, so you're milking two thirds, maybe. Uh, how do you, how did you reach that forty two thousand five hundred dollar figure? Well, it's um, it's been a bit of an exercise in trying to determine how to allocate the the available we think are the available funds or hope are the available funds of forty million dollars among the categories, and we don't have a magic formula to do that. We did prioritize the smaller farms because of the, you know, the five years basically of depressed milk prices. We know that puts the smallest farms in a very vulnerable spot. They're often not as able to, they don't have the same assets or the same economies of scales and aren't as able to reach um, alternate mechanisms to survive. But we also believe that some of the larger operations are more likely eligible for other forms of federal aid, like the pay, Paycheck Protection Act, the PPP, or the EIDL grant. So on some level, because the goal is to maintain these farms, we, we had five already <laughs> closed this month and we don't want to lose any more. I think that we tended toward trying 
to protect the smallest and most vulnerable. So potentially their entire losses um, may be covered. Their entire loss is related. You know, this is all short term. None of us know how long this is going to unfold, but they have an opportunity potentially to have all of their losses related to COVID-19 covered. We, we considered doing a variety of other things. The large farms, some of them are, I think some of them, one or two, maybe over 3,000 cows. So if we allocated it per cow or by 100 weight, the large farms uh, would get an enormous payment, which again is a policy choice, but that would take away from the payments obviously to the smaller farms. And given that 80% of our farms roughly are in those smaller categories, we uh, tended toward trying to protect that vast majority of the farms while also obviously bolstering the rates as the farm size goes up. So the large farm would get about two and a half times, maybe a bit more than that, than the smallest farm. But we did not try to um, designate the dollars exactly by production or by cow. And we had that discussion. It's an important one. Uh, oftentimes, as I understand it, dairy policy is um, designated by production. And we had some concerns about doing that only because that tends to also lead to overproduction at times. But there's no magic formula here, Senator. We, we tried to do it in a way. One thing that we really wanted to ensure is that everyone is, who is eligible would be able to qualify for the maximum grant. So, you know, within these categories, we're, we're trying to divvy up to $40 million. And then we have some contingency plans, I'll explain, for folks. Uh, and, and, and if the money's not expended, what might happen with that, any extra money? But does that answer your question? Yeah, well, for the time being, uh, and Ruth wanted to know about how you're going to deal with the processor money. Yeah, so that should I go ahead or? Sure, sure. Okay, okay. So you needed that mute um, button. Bob, Bobby, <laughs> um, uh, John O'Brien has his hand up, and I don't know if it's a question regarding what um, Steve just said or not, but uh, I don't want to cut Ruth off, but. Um, he, he's putting his little blue hand up, and I know you're you're not necessarily paying attention to little blue hands. No, if that was green, I might, but blue. Uh, so did you have a question in regards to dairy, John? I did, Bobby. Um, yeah, Steve, go for I, it. Just while we're on, on, on this part of it, the 40 million part, how is it going to work for the, the farmers to prove um, lost revenue and expenses you know for example if if you're shipping to an organic um processor your losses have been a lot less just because that that price has remained a lot higher whereas if you're a dfa or agrimart you know is it going to be up to the processor to show this is what milk would have been and now this is what it's where it's at or or are each of the 650 farms going to have to show you know we would have gotten this milk check but now it's you know, 40% of what it would have been? So that's a that's a great question. And I don't know that the parameters are all fully drawn and in part because we, we knew you all would have uh, input as well, but the milk prices we project is where the majority of the losses are going to be. In the proposed legislation, we didn't draft a comparator, a comparative period. So when we estimated roughly $66 million in losses this year, related to milk prices, I, I understand that we averaged last year's price to this year's expected price, and that that was about a $2.42 difference per hundred weight. So that's an, that's an average that we use to get to the 100 million, uh, 100, I'm sorry, the 66 million. So whether or not that's the right comparator, I, I don't know. I mean, January, the price this year was, I think about 1813 for conventional milk. I believe most people projected that the milk prices would actually go up this year. And instead, um, they dropped starting in February, they dropped about a dollar. In March, they dropped again. And then in April, it was precipitous, almost $3, and just from a month over month. So I, I think it would probably be advantageous to have in the legislation, at least for the price of milk, what the comparator point is. So for instance, maybe it's the January milk price, maybe it's something different. It's gotta be related to the pandemic, we know that. It can't just be arbitrary. But as I've been thinking about it, I think perhaps a January price is a reasonable price to, because it's real, we know it's there, it's not the projected 
uh, increase that we expected. But we, we think in the summer prices may be down, you know, more than $5 uh, from that January price. So that's a huge loss in a very short period of time. But so, but the milk prices are only one thing. I mean, the, the CRF fund covers both expenses and loss related to the pandemic. So, you know, and this may apply more to processors and farmers, but everybody has had to adjust. And so, yes, we are envisioning that people tell us how they've lost. We did not build in the parameters of how they have to do that, whether we should or not is a reasonable question, but we wanted to be as open as possible for everybody to tell us what their losses are, rather than for us to try to project what they may be. They're the business, they're the ones operating. They have to certify to us that these are real losses. They have to do so, you know, and, and, and demonstrate those losses. So, you know, milk prices is probably the easiest thing, but if somebody, you know, if a um, married couple is operating a farm and the husband suddenly stays home to watch the kids because the kids are no longer in school and they have to hire an employee to cover the, the husband's no longer participating, you know, that to me is also a valid expense. So we didn't define it because we didn't want to limit it, but re a great question. Yeah, Michael, uh... Michael O'Grady, uh, can we use, do you think we can use a January uh, figure to determine the downturn in the price and have it qualify as a loss? I think that's a possibility. You also have other possibilities. I'm looking at the CFAP rule, the federal uh, assistance rule, and, and they're using um, basically the first quarter production times the determined payment rate. So th there, there's opportunity for you to come up with different payment structures depending on what you want to do. Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, Steve, um, I think we're all set um, <clears throat> to, Sharon, uh, did you have a question? Thank you. Um, I was just hoping that um, Steve could repeat the number of cer certified small farms and large farm operations in the state because the, the sound cut out when he did that. Sure. I don't know that I gave the number of each independently, but I, but I did say about 80% total are within those categories. And I know the rough numbers, but, I, but they're, they're still a bit fluid as we nail them down. But I, I think roughly it's about 260 in each category. And I think small farms are a bit smaller than that. And certified small farms may be more like 264. But essentially, there's about 670 dairies right now. And approximately 520 to 530 of them are in the two smallest categories. Yeah, and 105 medium size and about 33 large firms. We, uh, yeah. Uh, can we get to Ruth's question uh, uh, now on the how you're going to pay out for the manufacturing processing? A absolutely. So, so what we've what we've proposed is paying the dairy processors based on the category of their license. So what that means? So dairy processors are licensed with us based on the pounds of milk they process per day. So there are six different categories initially, and you may see proposed legislation that also had a seventh category with frozen desserts. As we've borne down on the data more, it looks like we don't have it. We thought we had four. It looks like we don't have any of those anymore. So it should be just the six categories based on milk process per day. So the range for the payments is, is 56,500 at the lowest end. And I'll tell you the, where they fit in just a moment. The high that we propose is 185,000 for the largest um, processors of whom there are only a few. But the, most of our processors fall in the category of under 500 pounds processed per day. And that's the 56.5 that we've proposed. The next category is, is markedly larger, 500 pounds, to 9,999. 
So that's up to 20 times bigger than the smallest category. Then the next, and sorry, that the maximum, again, these are maximum grant payments depending on showing economic harm. The maximum grant to those processors, we propose $70,000. The next size is from 10,000 pounds to 49,999. And we propose a maximum grant of $97,000. The next size is 50,000 to 99,999. And that proposed maximum grant is 127,000. Only two left. The next one is 100,000 to 499,999. And that maximum grant is 157,000. And then the final category is those processors who uh, process over 500,000 pounds of milk a day. And the proposed grant for that group is $185,000. So again, um, almost 80% of our processors are in the two smallest categories. The, so most of them are in the under 500 pound range and then uh, the, the next biggest chunk by far are in the 500 to 9,999 category. There's about 20% about are in the next categories um, and, and only four that, I think there's only four in the biggest category and four in the second to biggest category. So again, we're bottom heavy in terms of the number of different processors we have. So there's a, if you'd like, there's a couple of other parts of our proposal that I could outline and then, and then I'll be done if that's okay. I'll be left, so I'm gonna say sure. <laughs> Go ahead and finish. What was your small amount again, though? That's the one thing I didn't hear. The, for this, but under 500 pounds? The, the dollar amount, Senator? Yeah, yes, the dollar amount. 56,500. 56,500, okay. Why don't you finish, then I have follow-up question. Okay. So, as discussed earlier, this is a, all of these grants are, are proposed maximum Steve, in the law. Steve, yes. Steve, I'm sorry to interrupt, but no. Rodney had his hand up. Um, so Rodney, do you still want to ask a question about what uh, Steve was yeah, just saying? I, I just, my question was, uh, so the larger processors include any of the co-ops like Agrimark or um, DFA or any of those? I, I believe so. I believe so, Representative. I think it's all processors who, yes, I believe they are included, but they're not necessarily in the in the very largest category. Yeah, but uh, so some of these some of these processors are putting a surcharge on farmers' milk checks, uh, COVID surcharges. So I, I, with the hope that we can figure out how they don't get a double whammy. I mean, get double paid by the farmer and get also get grants from state? Well, that's a great question. And I was actually just about to go into some of the limitations on this. And, and, and that is these have to be actual losses. Not only do they have to be actual losses, but they also cannot be insured losses and they can't be covered by other federal grants. And, and that we believe is a federal legal requirement but we also think it obviously makes good sense. None of this money is designed to profit, to cause anyone, to give anyone profit. It's, allow, it's designed to allow them to survive actual losses. So part of what we envision in the proposal, and this is in the legislation, the draft legislation, but also in our application will be, you have to both certify that you have these losses and also certify that these same losses are not covered by either insurance or another federal grant. So we do want people to be covered as much as possible for all losses. So if they're, so we want them to use the money as long as it's real, but they can't use it twice. They can't. Yeah, so, so if they're, if they're taking a percentage of the uh, farmer's paycheck to cover their losses, that's not a federal grant. 
That's not insurance. It's taken right out of the farmer's pocket. So, so my, I guess my point would be then, then that's revenue for them and they can only claim losses. So if they've, you know, to put numbers out there, if they, if there's, if they have, if they claim $500 in losses, but they've taken a hundred dollars from this surcharge, then from my perspective, they'd have $400 in actual losses because they've used a surcharge to recoup some of that loss. But in no way has this program or any of the programs been set up to try to make them whole. It, it you know, uh, like on the example you just gave, if they had 500 in losses, they got 100 out of the farmer, uh, and we put in 400, that means their losses would be, um, you know, no skin off their hands, they'd just be covered. And it, in no way are we gonna cover all the farmer losses or all the hospital losses or, you know, the, the food, um, shelves losses, uh, you know, we aren't, there isn't enough money to cover anybody's total losses. And I think, so I think that's right. So that's what we feel too, Senator, that there's not enough money um, to go around, but we did try to design this proposal so that we could cover the losses to each farmer up to the maximum proposed grant. So we tried to design it that if every farm within each category had those losses, we'd have enough money to pay everyone for those losses. We don't believe we have enough money to pay everybody for their actual losses. Yeah. And Bobby, could, yeah. I, could, I, could I just interject here? Um, <clears throat> and in, in, in the next few minutes, the House members are gonna have to leave to go because we have a, uh, we have four at 11. Um, earlier in this conversation, there was a question about uh, favoring the smaller farmers. And Allison Eastman uh, sent me a chat and I'm just gonna read it because uh, it's pretty clear. It says, just a point to make, the large farms receive the PPP, which most likely will become a grant. Whereas the majority of small farms didn't get the PPP, the pay Paycheck Protection Program. Um, uh, usually the husband and wife are not on the payroll as they operate as a sole proprietor. We also took that into consideration when figuring the max grant amounts. But they could get the PUA unemployment program through the state. Yeah, Is we're under we're understanding that a lot of them have been having trouble accessing PUA. So that would be, you know, I'd be interested if if you've taken testimony, which I'm not aware of. Um, I, I tend to watch your live feeds after the fact. Um, but from what we're hearing, the PUA has been very difficult for them to access as well. So the PPP, you know, obviously there are some small farms that do have folks on payroll and they would have been able to access it. But the larger the farm, the larger the PPP um, and the larger the, the grant that would be, um, you know, the amount that then would become a grant in the end. So we did take that into consideration as well as idle and all of the programs that they uh, would be eligible for. And how, how did the, uh, how did they um, take the announcement? Did you gain pushback? No, to be honest with you, we've had um, very productive conversations. Um, and I think folks have been very positive about not only the work that's been done by uh, your committee, uh, we tried to frame this. So we were in line with the proposals similar to what Senate Ag was working on by farm size. Um, and, you know, it, it was tough. As Steve said, we were looking at pounds of production by cow. Uh, then looking at, you know, what they were able to be eligible for, for grants um, in, in totality. Um, it was hard. And Steve kept reminding us that we need to have equity uh, within this. I see he's smirking, but he's, he's very good at making sure that we stay straight and narrow. So um, I just want you all to understand that we have gone through the exercise and no matter which way you know, we continue to look at the figures, there still seems to be uh, some inequity in it. And, um, you know, our secretary has been uh, very 
uh, you know, forward with us that we need to not separate organic from conventional. And we recognize that there's two different pricing systems and sometimes three. There's folks that don't ship to a, they ship direct to a processor that's uh, processing cheese and they're not going through the federal pricing system. So it, it gets really dicey when we're trying to base it on uh, prices because not everybody goes to the Boston blend price or the federal prices that we see. We assume it, uh, but that's not the truth. Yeah, are there uh, other questions from any of the other members? Um, because, uh, uh, Ruth? Well, if, if a house member has a question, I, I, I would defer to them because I know they have to leave. Uh, I don't see any hands up. Who, pardon? I don't see any hands up, any no. house members' uh -huh. hands up. Then, um, the, then I ahead. do have a, a, just a specific question. And I have broader questions that I can wait on. But um, Steve, I'm wondering if if a process, if a dairy farmer of, of any type is also also does on farm processing, would they qualify for both programs, the the dairy farmer program and also the processor program and and would you need them to split out the two sides of their operation in order to show separate losses or how did you account for that well that's a great question senator and we have discussed that and as we are proposing it we think it's uh perfectly acceptable for them to recover both as a processor and as a farmer provided that they have the losses in each in each distinct category so it would have to be separately done and they are separately registered or licensed with us. But if a farmer is a farmer and a processor and they have distinct losses in both sides of their business, business then we think that's a, a viable thing for them to recover in both capacities. The, uh, the other issue, I mean, it deals with all this, but over on, on the Senate side, of course, I sit in appropriations as well as, as on, uh, on ag, and we keep hearing, um, well, what's a, what's, what are you doing with this money that's gonna fix the problem or sort of fix it, help fix it for the long term? And, and of course, in the, over on the ag, uh, in the Senate side, we've talked, off and on all winter about setting up a different way of marketing uh, our milk and pricing, not marketing so much as pricing our milk with an in-state order instead of going with the federal order out of Boston, which New York is, has basically taken a lot of the class one market away from, from Vermont. Um, and our milk, almost 60% now is utilized here in Vermont. So we could do our own market pricing. Uh, did you guys talk about long-term issues that we might be able to incorporate into this to maybe alleviate the problem down the road that we're facing now or that we've faced for the last five years, basically. So uh, this, I, I can, go ahead, Steve. No, 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 you, Mr. Secretary, yeah. please. I, I, I would say uh, this, this really is about um, survival. And this is about getting people to the fall. And I, those are enormous policy discussions. And I'm not sure we have time to deal with those in this you know, particular bill. We are all about um, you know, change and trying to make a, a better spot for our dairy farmers. But I don't know if we if we can do that big a lift uh, to get there with this. Um, you know, and we may not be able to save uh, all the ones even with this package. And that's, and that's troubling. That's, you know, I never went at the agency wakes up every day hoping that we uh, can make a better, you know, a better life for our dairy farmers who give so much to uh, to Vermont that extend well beyond the farm to their communities to the travel and tourism industry, and and my fear is if if we don't we don't act on this we're going to lose many 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 farms and that would be uh, much much worse 
uh, a situation uh, for our communities. And I, I believe we can have those thoughtful discussions once we get through the crisis. I know the Vermont Milk Commission is, is, is forwarded a, you know, a, a growth management plan and, and we continue to see some action on that. I know some of the co-ops have taken action on their own with this issue, and albeit very, very difficult for our dairy farmers to, uh, to do this sort of on the fly, but I think they may be more open to discussions about a growth management plan than they were maybe pre-COVID. So I think, I think uh, you know, our, our goal right here is, is not to, uh, is, is, is really try to get people to, to the fall so we, we can reevaluate and see where we're headed on a, on, a, on a bigger level. And of course, we all know dairy is really complicated right now because it is a federal system and it's very, it's, it's, it's very hard for us to, um, you know, distance ourselves from that if, if we just go it alone. But we're open to those discussions. We just don't think we have the time within the two week uh, period here to do that. Bobby, Bobby, um, it's, it's uh, a little before 11 and the house members are gonna have to jump off here and go on the floor. Um, I, I wanna, I, I, I just wanna thank you for including us in this. And it's really good to see all the senators here on the meeting. Um, Are you doing anything important in there or just going to go in and listen? Um, well, I, I'm expecting we're always going to do something important. <laughs> <laughs> well, so thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep working on this. And um, I don't know where this bill is, if it's going to start out in the Senate or start out in the House and and we'll try to get to that in the next few minutes. And, and we, we should meet again, I would hope, soon with, with you folks and figure out logistics and, and all that. I, I would like that. Thanks Don't forget a lot. about our food security stuff when, when you guys are talking uh, you know, by, your own, by your own committee because I think somewhere yeah. in here, we're going to have to incorporate something into our bill along those lines as well. We've, we've been talking a lot about uh, a, a regional food uh, supply system, uh, which I find really exciting. So um, let's, let's continue that conversation. I don't know if it takes the form of a bill or what, but um, uh, I think it's great to work together and it's, it's good to see you all. Yeah, well, have a good session and we'll we'll keep rolling. Thanks, Thanks Bobby. Thank you guys. See ya. Thank you all. So, um, committee, uh, do you have questions for Anson or uh, Steve? Uh, Anthony, I uh, see your hand up. Yeah, one is a comment and the other is a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just think it'll be interesting to see how some of the large processors talk about what their losses are, given the fact that they're provide, they're paying less for the milk that they're processing. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting idea that they're going to present losses. I'm curious how they're going to go. I'm not saying they can't do it, but I'm curious how they're going to go about doing it, since they're getting their raw product at a much lower price, and yet they're still selling things in the supermarket for the same prices. So that's just a comment. But people just mentioned before they got off the line, the House members that came up a little briefly, people mentioned food sovereignty and hunger programs. And my question is whether, I mean, I appreciate the fact that all this time and energy went into coming up with the program for dairy farmers, which I think is important. But I'm wondering whether we're gonna put as much energy and time into developing programs to support non-dairy farmers, you know, vegetable farmers or other kinds of livestock producers who, have suffered losses as well, and also need to make investments to adapt to the new marketplace. You know, whether it's organizing CSAs or developing processing plants or developing websites, whatever it might take for non-dairy farmers to survive this price crisis as well. So I'm just wondering if the agency has started putting time into coming up with a proposal for non-dairy farmers as well as Anthony, for the dairy farmers. May May I answer that for the WeLab sure, board? Sure. So quickly, um, when COVID came along, um, Senator Polina, one of the first things that uh, we had brought forward to the secretary was we had uncommitted funds um, in the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. Um, and we were able to 
um, some, some of that money, it came from different avenues. Um, so we were able to look at funds that previously had been put into pockets of transitioning farms years ago um, into organic and it was sitting. There was some money at NOFA, some money at Vermont Ag Credit Corp. Not a lot of money, but it adds up. And so we approached Secretary Tebbets and uh, were able to just uh, release a program uh, for grants uh, ranging from 5,000 to 25,000. We put it up on our social media uh, to assist these uh, producers with exactly what you're saying, those that had to change to do online ordering with their websites. Um, also, I know the administration had put 750,000 in um, one-time money into um, working lands for this year. And they're, they're interested in working with the legislature to continue uh, potentially that money to be used for COVID. Um, and it is nice to know that a $5,000 grant can really help those um, producers develop websites and such and up to 25,000, it seems to be advantageous. The other part, and maybe the secretary will touch more on this is, um, it's, it's our understanding that, um, you know, agriculture, the dairy farms are, are regulated um, under two divisions at our agency, uh, dairy and water quality. So we have a pretty good pulse of what's going on in that community. Um, and also are able to uh, give the numbers as to how many we have. Now, when it comes down to fruits and veggies and other producers, we don't necessarily have that type of data. So it's our understanding that these producers do and will qualify for the programs that are being rolled out at ACCD. Um, so I don't want anybody to think they've been excluded. Um, that's not the intention here. And we are working with ACCD um, on our legislation as we move forward um, to see what programs they will be able to qualify for. So I know Secretary Tebbets had a meeting last night about that uh, very thing and perhaps he wants to build on it, but I appreciate the question. I think it's great. We don't want folks to think we're leaving others out and it's just about dairy. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I would, I would just encourage that, that all that, that are in agriculture to really uh, take a deep dive and look at some of those programs that are being unveiled by the, the Commerce Agency. One of the goals through this was to try to, try to develop programs that could be run um, you know, efficiently, not too complicated. We could get them out the door. So we, we were willing to take on the dairy component and the other folks that are in uh, other forms of agriculture, whether it be a sugar maker, maybe it's a sugar maker that has sustained losses uh, because of COVID because they basically didn't have any retail at their sugar house because no one could visit during this period of time. So they should, they should poke around and look at, at the, uh, the Commerce Department <laughs> Avenue um, and there's substantial monies that are going to be available for that. So I, I'm all for this, and and I, I hope we uh, I hope we're, that anyone in agriculture that sustained losses uh, that they'll reach out to us. We can work with them. Uh, you know, we are we're doing our best to make sure that everyone in agriculture is 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 covered and 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 try to make up for the losses. Totally totally agree and totally understand, and that's one of the reasons immediately we repurposed that money and, and got the application out the door so it's an active application now uh, for folks under the working lands and i think it's open to the 31st uh, so that's uh, those are important grants um, out there as well for folks to, that that's on, out in the field already that's non-dairy i'm sorry did you say they're open until the 31st yes, yes. To the 31st yes so if somebody wants to apply would have to apply between now and the 31st correct that's correct the, and, and think, Senator, I mean, uh, that's, that's because of the year end 630 sure. so the money needs to be obligated by 630 there was no intent to rush um folks for this application but by the time it was de-obligated uh the board act acted very fast um to make sure that we could get it obligated by 630. but so will there be more money after that then yes yep so there's 750,000 one one-time money in the governor's um budget last year the legislature had put five hundred thousand dollar one one-time money which was targeted to dairy um and there's some great projects um that those were put towards in this fiscal year so next year there's 750 in the governor's budget um to be honest i'm not i can't remember what was in um the latest draft of the bill i'd have to probably look to mike o'grady for that um, but at, at this point, I know that last night the administration had made contact with um, both the secretary and I asking if that could be utilized for COVID relief. And it's over and above um, 
you know, what the, the regular general fund money was. So 750 right. could be very helpful uh, during these times for COVID relief. Well, we just want to make sure that we have adequate funding as we go forward through the rest of the year, <clears throat> not just fiscal year, but the rest of the calendar year. Yeah. And I would also, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting kind of clogged up today. Well, it's, oh, it's hot temperature. I can't, can't adapt. But also, I want to make sure that we're making it clear to farmers that this money is available. Because I still hear from folks, I've heard from folks as of yesterday who are saying, you know, when are we going to do something for non-dairy farmers? So I think the fact, maybe the program just needs to be made more clear to the public and to the farmers who might benefit from it. And we, as you've said, we want to make sure that we are really building a food system, which includes dairy, includes diversified non-dairy, and also includes hunger programs, nutrition programs. So we need to come out with a, with a strategy that helps us rebuild the system stronger than we started out with. But I appreciate what you explained so far. That sounds good, but we just make, need to make sure it's enough. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hey, Michael uh, O'Grady, have you been running any of their numbers um, that are paid out to, like for small farms, small farm certified, uh, like the 42,500 for the 271 farms. Have you run any of those numbers yet? To see what, what do, you, the, do you want to know what the total is for those? I, I think it, it put a little different perspective on things when you get see the total going to the small farm uncertified, small farm certified on the way up through because we're dividing up 40 million there and and um, up through to the large. I, yeah, I, have you, yeah, so we should have those numbers to sort sure, of. Sure, I, I have rough numbers. Um, so a small non-certified would be about 10.5 million. A certified small farm would be a, basically 15.9, 16 million. The medium, hold on a second, the medium is, um, Oh, hold on a second. That the medium's nine point five, yeah. approximately nine point four five, and the large is um, three. yeah, exactly three point six. Three point six three. To, yeah. to be honest with you, Michael, I think the large is going to be more than that. We often say there's thirty three large farms in Vermont. Some of them have two large farm facilities registered. So there's, um, that's, that's the part what Steve was talking about that, you know, we're, we're registered. If they pay two LFO permits, are they eligible for two LFOs to receive these types of payments? Well, sure. I, I think that's a question about policy for the committee. Yeah. For yeah. The General Assembly. Wow. So, so as of this morning, um, our conversation was oftentimes we say there's 33 LFOs, but there's 42. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, there's 42 that pay invoices to the state uh, for an LFO fee. Well, then that would increase the number to 4.2. Yep. That sounds right. Uh, how come we were given 33 when we asked for the numbers? Well, I think it's because of the owners, right? How many LFOs? And so they have multiple locations that they're paying for. I think it's the way that we're asked the question and how we're relaying the information, quite honestly. Well, I think we asked for the number of LFOs. We didn't ask for the number of farmers LFOs. Uh, we asked for the number of LFO farms. And, Correct. And yeah. I think... Again, Senator, um, I apologize for the confusion, but when you're talking to the dairy division, it's very different from talking to the water quality division. Water quality regulates each location. And, you know, dairy, that's where we're trying to, um, you know, get our numbers so they're in line. Uh, Ruth, you had a question, and Chris? Um, Chris, if you want to go ahead, because you haven't been here. Okay. Um, He's been having fun. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, well, I, first of all, I just want to thank Anson and Steve and Allison for 
for coming and presenting this and giving us these details. It's really helpful to hear it. And, you know, as a senator from Madison County, I appreciate that you've spent so much time trying to figure out a program that makes sense for dairy farmers. Um, and I want to pick up a little bit on what Senator Polina was saying about all making sure we take care of all of our farmers and the entire food systems and agriculture sector. Um, and Allison, I appreciate what you were saying about the WeLab grants that you got those out. And I would love to, if you could provide us with more details and a list perhaps of those grants so we can sort of see where those investments went and for what kind of thing. Um, it, as soon as you have that information available, that would be helpful to have. Um, but it's striking to me, um, frankly, Secretary Tebbets, that the Agency of Agriculture is not stepping up to make things easy across the board for agriculture. Um, um, and instead is, is relying on the Agency of Commerce and Community Development um, and sort of throwing uh, farmers and producers um, that are not dairy farmers or dairy producers into the bucket with all other kinds of businesses. And while in some ways that obviously makes sense. In other ways, it makes it much, much harder for those, those people and those um, businesses and farmers in this sector. And it's, it's a little disappointing that the Agency of Agriculture isn't stepping up to make sure that they are taken care of and that they don't have as much, as many hoops to go through. Because as you've noted, it's been really hard for some people to get PUA or to get PPP and all these other programs. And I think we should be making it as the agriculture committee and committees and the agency should be making it as easy as possible for all farmers to qualify and get the funding they need to cover their expenses and their losses during this crisis. Um, and I also note that there's not anything in here for food security, which is something that we've been talking about a lot in this committee and how do we link food security with local agriculture and um, local foods and, and, and um, making sure that we're feeding people and that we're creating a local market for our farmers of all types. Um, and finally, there's nothing in the package that's directed toward workers. Um, and this is something that we've, we as the Senate have tried really hard to do um, across the board with the Essential Workers Program and also this committee working on um, farm worker program to retain farm workers. Um, so uh, I guess I, I see those as kind of big holes in your proposal, even though, um, you know, I, I more or less uh, like the general idea you have for dairy. I, I think I'm a little disappointed that you didn't take a more comprehensive approach as the agriculture agency. Uh, thank you, Senator. And I, I would just stress that farmers that are non-dairy are still eligible to go through the commerce uh, application. The commerce agency is also, uh, you know, trying to develop a program that's, that is not complicated, can be used you know, using tax records, uh, losses, uh, et cetera. So I think, you know, we are working with them and, and we're happy to message to the non-dairy community uh, uh, that program. We've also already rolled out, as we mentioned, the, the working lands program. We, we <laughs> also get money to get that out the door. Um, so I, I, I totally agree with you that we are all about all agriculture. And I think our record is pretty strong across the agency of, of doing that. Uh, working, um, we, we issued a comprehensive report working with uh, Farm to Plate that that program is, you know, we did half of that report. It's already done and ready to be implemented. We just need to keep working on that. And, you know, I'm really proud of our ag development Agriculture Development Division. Uh, they've been working around the clock, uh, getting resources, getting uh, information to people, looking for any possible grant money for them. Um, and most of the work that they've been doing has been in the non-dairy section. So I, I, I think maybe we're just not messaging it correctly um, uh, to, to, the, to the public that that work is being done. And uh, totally agree. We're, we're, we're all about making any farmer what they're doing viable and important and they're all very very important to us um you know no you know shape size difference it doesn't matter to us we want everyone to be uh part of the community and and, and valuable so you're right we'll continue to work on that and we'll redouble our efforts on making sure that maybe we just need to message that uh we are those programs are out there 
I know we issued a press release on the, uh, the WeLab. Uh, maybe we need to issue it again. I know we have a, a significant listserv that we, we send information out to folks. Um, you know, we've done it over social media channels. We know farmers are extremely busy this time of year, so they may not have been able to um, you see it. But it's been out there uh, for a while, and, and <coughs> hopefully people will apply and we'll get some dollars out there. We've been working with the Vermont Community Foundation on food security. The agency was able to secure a $60,000 uh, grant to take uh, milk and butter and yogurt and repurpose that uh, product uh, to uh, folks that were in need. Uh, that was significant. From that, the private sector has stepped up. Uh, they are also are um, uh, donating dollars to that. So we think we can do another run of that, getting yogurt and butter and, and milk out to, uh, to folks. Um, so we, we continue to work on that. Our, our agency was uh, involved in trying to make sure that the, the, the box program with the USDA was able to take part in Vermont. Um, Trevor Lowell, who was in our Ag Dev, Ag Dev division, uh, was instrumental in, in working with the education department and all the partners pulling that complicated application together. That's a $5.8 million program for Vermont. Um, it also purchased uh, a considerable amount of local produce. Um, I just saw in, in uh, Franklin County, some uh, potato farmers are contributing to those boxes. Um, they just had one yesterday in Burlington. Um, so we're doing our best to move this stuff along and, and maybe we just got to re-up our efforts and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Anson. Chris? Um, and we forgot the ag worker piece. You might want to touch on that as well, too. Oh, sure. Yes. And, and we've been involved in, um, uh, and Director Davis has taken the lead with the administration on that particular component of, a, of, of this uh, subject. So we've had conversations with her through the agency of administration. Um, so that, that one continues to, to be discussed. And, and we've had a couple of positive uh, uh, discussions with Director Davis on that as well. How is that for the for workers on farms? Any farm workers? That's my understanding. Yes, I think that that Ms. Davis <laughs> is also talking about broadening it to people who are not necessarily farm workers, but just immigrants in general. I think that's correct. Yes, uh, Chris, uh, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, a question for. Uh, the secretary or the deputy secretary. Um, I'm curious if I, I've been trying to think of, and, and I know others have, of sort of a multiplier effect. And, and um, as we give COVID relief uh, to different sectors of the economy, trying to come up with strategies that would multiply the impact. And so one example is restaurants. Uh, we all recognize uh, the food service universe is just been devastated uh, by these last few months and their busy season for many of them. Uh, the months ahead is looking pretty bleak. Um, and so the, the governor's proposal, uh, the administration's proposal uh, directs a lot of money to restaurants as an example. And I'm wondering if you have been part of any thinking that would um, make it possible for some of that money to then be used to promote local agricultural products. So, so in other words, uh, sweeten the deal somehow as we provide relief to restaurants, if they are then committed to buying locally. It seems to me a real opportunity to get a little extra bang for our buck um, and, and help two sectors of the economy. And I'm curious if, I, I just want to know if, if there's been thinking like that, if you would join us as we try to have those kinds of strategic discussions and, and uh, if you could comment, thank you. Sure, uh, Senator, I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation with, uh, with the Commerce Agency and maybe there's, a, there's an avenue to, to look at that. We have been involved in a, in a pilot project that we're trying to get together uh, with um, uh, Brattleboro, where we're trying to get together uh, using some relief dollars uh, to make meals for folks. 
and use uh, as much local agriculture as we can. It's going to be a pilot project, and we hope if that's successful in the Brattleboro region, uh, we might be able to take it statewide, but we thought it would be best to um, work through a pilot program first. We've been working with um, uh, uh, the public safety uh, agency on that um, and through FEMA and through uh, that particular group. So there may be some COVID relief dollars that could be used for a, a restaurant program uh, to make meals. Uh, I know other ones are happening in the, in the Chittenden County region that are not uh, you know, necessarily uh, connected to uh, FEMA, but there's some private groups working on that. Uh, does that answer your question, Chris? Other questions from committee? Um, well, I, don't, I, would, I just want to go back to something that Senator Hardy mentioned, because I think it's important that we let farmers know that these things are available if they are going to be available. And I think in terms of messaging, there is sort of a feeling out there, and I'm not saying this is overt or not, but that the, everybody's coming together to support the dairy industry, which is fine. We all want to support the dairy industry, but I think we want to make sure that we're really putting the message out loud and clear that there are now and will be resources for non-dairy farmers as well. I think it is partly a messaging thing. I don't think the average vegetable farmer is gonna to go to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development to look for money. They're gonna wonder why they're not getting access to funds through the Ag Department, that, you know, that you're, you're their people, they're your people. You should be catering to them, not making them go to another agency. Yeah, and I, I've, done, uh, I've done my you know, darndest to try to do that, even when the program was unveiled. Um, last week, I, I made a point at, at that unveiling that it is, there are other opportunities for folks to participate. And you're, you're absolutely right. We'll continue to, to message to folks uh, that uh, there are other programs that are going to be available. Uh, one important thing is we've got to get, we got to know what the final thing's going to look like too, so we can determine, um, you know, what it's, you know, what it's going to look like. And I, I know you guys are working hard on that. So as soon as we you know, get something on paper that we think we can do, we will work our darndest uh, to make sure that everyone in Vermont uh, in the ag community knows about these programs and they may be eligible. We don't want to leave um, anyone out of this. Just a point of clarity too, and I don't know if this is helpful or not, but um, as somebody who previously sat in the legislature, I think it's important for us to maybe understand that, you know, working lands, um, the board as formed by the legislature has ACCD, Commerce, Forest Parks, Recreation, and the Agency of Ag on that board. We work very well together. And two years ago, Secretary Tebbets asked if we could, if we had a position, leave the agency, if we could reorganize the incoming position um, to work between commerce and agriculture. And during this time, I would say that that shared position has been instrumental in our relationship and working together with ACCD. So I want to clear the air on the fact that they're working with another agency and not with us. We have an individual that works for the agency of ag. His name is Kyle Harris. And he is on our ag development team and sits at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And in fact, we have an agr.covid response email that Kyle works on and also is in communication with Commerce. So we have um, a very fluid relationship with Commerce. And I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that. So a lot of times I get it, I understand it. We are their people. Um, but you know, during this time when we were working on farmers markets and guidance, we worked very closely uh, with Commerce. And Steve um, Collier has worked with their general counsel um, John Kessler. And so there's, there's some good communication going on between the two agencies. And I just want to make sure that that's understood. And it works well with the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative as well. Ruth, uh, go ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Bobby. And, and Allison, thank you. I, I appreciate how much your agencies work together. I just think that uh, not everybody out in the field um, necessarily knows that and um, uh, sort of, you know, they think of the agency of agriculture as as their agency or want to be able to think that. So um, the fact that you have a shared position isn't isn't as significant for the sort of average Vermonter who needs help right now. Um, although I do understand import how important it is at the sort of administrative <laughs> level. 
Um, I, I, a couple uh, last week, I reached out to Abby Willard because one of the things we've been talking about in this committee is is really sis, system changes um, and sector wide changes that would be helpful. I mean, to sort of pick up on um, something that Senator Pearson mentioned is how do we get the biggest bang for our buck? We have uh, we just had a whole Senate caucus talking about this that we want to invest the money, obviously, um, to uh, respond to an emergency in a crisis, but also how can we have multiplier effects yeah. that go beyond December 30th, 2020, and really make our ag sector and whatever sector we're talking about, our housing sector, our restaurant sector, our art sector, whatever it is, more resilient, more um, able to weather the next storm, and just sort of stronger for the entire state of Vermont. And so um, I asked Abby if she could send me a list, and a lot of them are based on on, as uh, Secretary Tebbets mentioned, the, the ag um, strategic plan that was worked on. And I'm wondering if you had um, sort of one or two things from a sector-wide sec uh, perspective that, you know, Abby put it in immediate term and just long, short term and long term kind of perspectives. But um, if you had some one or two things that if that you would include on a list that we should look at and think about as part of this package? To be honest with you, I think there's a bill, um, Mike O'Grady, that, that was drafted in House Ag that was started on the Ag Strategic Plan, correct? Yes, there was. Um, I think, uh, I don't know how to do this diplomatically. Um, earlier, Steve said that he believes that there needs to be cost or expenses related to COVID in order to qualify for any of the CARES Act funding. Um, some of the proposals made by um, Abby or Ellen, um, I think you need to be very persuasive in, in determining that they had expenses or costs incurred due to COVID. So I, I, I would ask the agency to, to see if they can find common ground between those two positions. Um, thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm wondering, um, you, you folks must have figured out something to do with, with the money to come up with, with the different categories. Um, I, I don't know, I have a hard time believing that we're gonna get rid of $16 million uh, to the farms below 50 cows. And so my question is, uh, what's gonna happen to the money if, if we don't get rid of it to the farms? I can answer that if you'd like, Senator, at least our, what our proposal lays out. So you're absolutely right that, that allotting the money based on actual expenses is something that's important and something we thought about. And really, the expenses only start as of March 1st. So even right now, expenses or losses, we're talking about less than three months. So, but the funding is available to cover losses for the year. So what we propose is that anyone who submits an application will only be eligible for demonstrated losses as of the date of the application. Which However, is one, right? Um, say that again, Senator, sorry. Is that March one? No, no, sorry, so the date of the application. So let's say that you, this package is passed quickly, M maybe people can get their applications in by you know, oh. July 1st, we'll say. So, so the point is they could get their losses from March 1st until the date of the application. So if that's June 1st, I'm sorry, July 1st, that's four months. So their losses at four months are not their losses for the year, right? So what we propose is that they get their losses that they've already accrued in an initial payment. If that initial payment doesn't equal their maximum possible payment, that their application would be remain pending and then they could submit an addendum later in the year up until October 1st to cover their subsequent losses. So say July, August, September. So as of October 1st, 
they could submit an addendum to show additional losses up to the maximum, not, not beyond it. And then what we proposed was any money of it, because this money's not spent by December 30th, I believe we lose it. So our proposal is that any, any funding, any of those 40 million or 10 million appropriated funds that are not spent as of November 1st, that we could use the remaining funds to, for any farmer who's experienced losses during the pandemic. And we, and we think some of those losses may be more evident later in the year as crops are produced, as there's more data, more information. That's a, that's a loose proposal. We wanted to leave it open-ended as more information becomes unknown to us and known to the state, but obviously that could be tailored however anybody believes is, is best. So is that written into your proposed bill or is that? Yes. It is. And yes. where, where is your bill? Have you submitted it to the House, to the Senate? Uh, is it sitting in the administration's office? Uh, when are we going to get a copy of it? So I believe, I think we can send a, a draft of you uh, of it to you later today, if you'd like. I, I don't have a final because it did go to the administration and I don't know. Um, I, I know they're preparing to submit it as one package, including all the grants. And this actually, uh, there's one thing I wanted to say about the agency of um, agriculture administering these grants. One concern we have is we don't want bureaucratic delay any more than necessary. Yeah. So what we've been, so what we've already proposed is say approximately 800 applications between the farms and the processors coming to us, and so that's that's not going to be an easy task to process those quickly and um, and accurately. So part of the reason I think for using the other big funds, 100 million with tax, 174.2 uh, million with Vita, is that they are establishing programs and using known comparators so that they can quickly process that. So we hope that by being able to go through those distinct applications, which won't be any different than ours, it'll just go to a different person who oversees it. We hope that that will cut down on bureaucratic delay and hope that we can get those payments promulgated as quickly as possible. Any projection of uh, time or you haven't gotten that to that point yet? Well, we hope, um, you know, we hope, Senator, that we within, you know, that we're planning on the, in, in the proposed legislation test, first come, first served. So as soon as they're there and the demonstrated proof of econ har economic harm is shown, then we want to issue payments. So we want, we'll do it on a rolling basis as they come in and once they're complete, but we'd like to do it, you know, as quickly as possible. I, I hope you're faster than the UI stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't think we're going to have those same numbers, I hope. <laughs> well, you're going from zero to 700. Um, they went from 200 to 70,000 or whatever. Um, <laughs> other questions for uh, Anson or Steve or Allison? Um, so you don't know if it's going to start on the House side or the Senate side, right? Senator, I, I believe the I believe they were testifying in Senate Economic Development today. Uh, Commissioner Goldstein was in there today. Um, so I think the bill, I think she was going through the bill. So I think it's, uh, and I know they have a joint hearing tomorrow with Commerce and uh, uh, the Commerce side on the House side and also Senate Economic Development. So they they, they are taking up the bill and it's it's one um, entire package, but uh, it's, it's ready to be distributed um, is my understanding. So we can get it to you. So we, we may not see the bill then, right? I think that's a, that's a discussion for the legislature. I, I mean, um, um, they may, they may want to hand off that component to you. Um, yeah, well, um, yeah, I think it'd be kind of bad if if um, the Commerce Committee on either side starts doing ag policy. Um, but we'll um, we'll deal with that. Um, Bobby, I'm sure you can get the bill in this committee. We we have faith in your with your abilities. 
<laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I don't know about that, but you know, being a, a total package, uh, sometimes you're better off alone and sometimes you're better off, you know, teaming up with, but that, that's a good crew. We, we'll work with them somehow. Uh, so anything else from, from uh, the committee or Michael, or do you have any questions, Michael? I don't have any questions, but I'm about to send you a summary of the USDA CFAP rule. We were talking about it yesterday. Yeah. I talked to Wendy Wilton at FSA. Um, and I, I think I think you would want to look at this document to see some of the things that are going to be required of farmers or limitations on farmers. Um, so I'll send that out in the next five, 10 minutes. Yeah, you're going to send it to all of us? Yep. Yeah, yep. good. Um, so if there isn't anything else, uh, nothing. Brian, uh, where have you been all morning? You haven't gotten your hair cut and uh, you haven't asked any questions. I'm in a super listening mode, Mr. Chair. <laughs> You're a good man. Um, but anyhow, um, thanks a lot, uh, Anson and Steve and Allison. Uh, appreciate your time and your input. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll try to get hold of a copy of uh, the draft proposal and work from there. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you all so much. Bye bye.